Chalo Dilli. Onwards to Delhi. That was their battle cry. More than that, it was an expression of pain for a long sought after dream. A dream of freedom for India. Give me blood and I'll give you freedom, he had said. And from Singapore, on that overcast July day in 1943, the Azad Hind Fauj would begin its march to Delhi. They would reach Imphal, and for the first time, the Indian flag would flutter proudly in the Indian sky. Yet the moment of triumph would be fleeting. In the jungles of Burma, the forgotten army would make one last stand, and their dream was to shatter in the pain of defeat. More than half a century later, some of them returned. The Azad Hind expedition would retrace that historic march. This is the story of those who returned. With the lifting of the siege of Imphal, for thousands of men and women in the INA, the dream of marching on to Delhi had come to an end. They realized that Imphal, and beyond Imphal, the rest of India, was now beyond their reach. But for Netaji and his men, this was not to be the end. Because they knew that freedom carries a heavy price, like all precious things. Netaji and his army were prepared to pay that price with their lives, right where they were, in Burma. Give me blood and I will give you freedom, he said. And as the year 1945 dawned, the new battle cry was blood, blood, blood. in Burma is there a sight as striking as the view across the plain of Bagar, the deserted ancient capital on the dusty eastern banks of the mighty Irrawaddy River. The landscape is dominated by over 2,000 pagodas built during the reign of the Bagar dynasty, founded in 1044 by King Anorata. Anorata was the first to introduce Burma to Theravada Buddhism. The pagodas in and around the city are proof of how zealously the Bagars practice their faith. By the 12th century, Bagar became known as the city of four million pagodas. The city and its environs would move Netaji deeply. Later, he would write, interesting as Burmese politics was to me, the country and the people were even more so. I spent a great deal of my time in studying the ancient history of Burma and in discovering the old cultural contacts between the two countries. The culture and philosophy of Burma have been largely influenced by India. The pagodas of Burma, which have a unique charm of their own, are not devoid of Indian influence. In Bagar and in other old centers of Burmese culture, one can still see structures which form the transition between the typical Hindu temple and the typical Burmese pagoda. Over the centuries, 
These ancient pagodas have witnessed many upheavals. And in July 1975, a major earthquake destroyed a large number of them. But 30 years earlier, this city had withstood another great quake, a man-made one that shook it to its very foundations. The British 14th Army's advance into Burma seemed unstoppable. The INA decided to halt them where the Irrawaddy is at its narrowest, along the Baga Nyau stretch, as it was here that the British would attempt to cross the river. The man leading the British advance was General Sir William Slim. He had led two infantry divisions and an armoured brigade in Burma during 1942, when he had been defeated by the Japanese. Now, General Slim led the largest single army in the world. You know my plan. What it means is we are attacking five Japanese divisions dug in behind a 2,000-yard wide river. At the Irrawaddy, it was not the Japanese Imperial Army that General Slim was to meet, but the Indian National Army. The INA would now be fighting on the banks of the Irrawaddy rather than on the Brahmaputra. On January the 29th, 1945, Gurbak Singh Dillon was given orders to move the Nehru Brigade to Baga Nyau on the eastern bank of the Irrawaddy. Fifty years after the din and dust of battle have settled, Colonel Dillon contemplates the ruins of these once proud pagodas that had offered him and his men shelter when all had seemed lost, when the sky over Bagan was darkened by enemy aircraft raining down their bombs on the brave Indian contingent. Bagan has a very significant role in my freedom struggle. The men were hid here sometimes in pagodas, and Ananda Pagoda is the place where you, we used to store our rations. I owe a lot to the place and the people of Bagan. During the war, the largest of the pagodas, the Ananda, was completely deserted. Today, it teems with people as it serves as a venue for the local bazaar. Five decades are rolled back in Colonel Dillon's mind as he stands by the river, taking in the scene. This is the place where, in February 1945, I was given the task to hold the eastern bank of the Irrawaddy to stop General Slim's British 14th Army crossing the river. During my recce, I could see that all those beaches right up to Nyangu were covered with human beings the soldiers of the 14th Army. They could afford to do that because they were supreme in the air. I did not have even a single plane, no artillery. 
and I had to face them with only 1,200 men of the Nehru Brigade, only 1,200. They must be about 30,000 strong, leaving aside the artillery, the air power, and all that. I fail to understand after 50 years when the din and the noise of the battle is behind me, what made me stand here to oppose this, the longest river crossing in World War II, as General Slim put it? What made us stand? I feel proud that we did stand. Though we failed, but here, as Netaji used to say, that we were waging war to pay the price of India's liberty. Here my men opposed. I bow to their souls who became martyrs here for the freedom of my beloved India. Oh. This place to me is very sacred. I wish those men were with me. The British troops amassed on the west bank of the Irrawaddy were strong enough in numbers and in arms to ford the river and continue their march onto Rangoon. The only factor holding them back was their uncertainty about the enemy's exact strength. Colonel Dillon's tactics were largely responsible for this. He had divided the Nehru Brigade into three units so that the British would overestimate their numbers. The 400-strong 7th Battalion, under Lieutenant Hariram, was located at Nyau. The 9th Battalion, with 500 men, was to occupy the area at Bagan under Captain Chandarbhan. Lieutenant Khan Muhammad and his men in the 8th Battalion would be in reserve at Tethe. By the first week of February, the stage was set for what would go down in history as the longest opposed river crossing in any theater of World War II. General Slim would later record in his book, Defeat into Victory. I had also read some military history, and I could not call to mind a single instance when a river had been successfully held against determined assault. As the time drew near for the first crossing, I hugged this thought to me. Historically, the odds were in my favor. This is the place where the first shot was fired by the British as well as by ourselves, Nyangu Ferry, the shortest breadth of the river Irrawaddy, which General Slim wanted to use to cross the 14th Army. That shot was fired somewhere under that hill, at the bottom of the hill, where a platoon of our uh, uh, Nehru Brigade was placed. At midnight of 7th and 8th February 1945, the British patrol came. They were challenged by our sentry, and the leader of the British patrol shot the sentry dead. Our second sentry shot the British captain dead, and we were quits. This is very important, because that was the start of the battle. For the next three days, both sides stayed entrenched in their positions. On the 11th of February, 
I learned that most of the dogs on the other side and in between, there are so many villages on the islands. Those dogs were killed. So we thought that night attack is coming when dogs won't bark and uh, we would be surprised. So we were very much alert. The night passed. The next day started aerial bombing. It was a carpet bombing. That is, they started in front thinking that our men were there in the trenches. But to hide ourselves from the sight of those hills, our men had been placed in the rear so as to go in front, take up the position when the enemy advances. But the whole day, bombing kept on. At about midday, the carpet bomb bombing of the front row stopped. We thought that they have gone. And now the land forces will come to attack us. So our men, from who had hidden themselves in pagodas, they came forward and took their position along the river bank. But Instead of the land forces coming, again, the carpet bombing started, and this time they took the rear area. I was at Tathe, so I was worried. I thought there will be enormous number of casualties, and I was surprised when I reached Chandrabhan. I said, how many people are injured? He said, not a single one. And he told me the story, and we were simply lucky. A full-scale attack was expected the next day, yet nothing happened. On the night of the 13th, Bagar would face the first assault. On the night of 13-14, at midnight, in front of 8th Battalion, that is at Bagan, Indian Brigade was put into action. And when they came in their uh, country boats, one of my company commanders, as soon as the attack started, he went all out. He fired, and along with it, he shouted, Chalo Delhi, Chalo Delhi. And the voice was heard, one person saying, and some British might have heard it because he said, Oh, they are Chalo Deli Wallas. They are our own men. Let us withdraw. And in the Shamozal, there was panic amongst the boatmen. They were mostly uh, Myanmar people, and th those were country boats. So they suffered, about 20 of their boats sunk, so many people killed, which we could not count. And as I reached the spot, Chandrabhan showed me that this has been the result. So I thought that we have won the day. Halted at Pagan, the British launched another assault opposite Niau. This time, a British outfit, the South Lancashire Regiment, was pressed into service. For the INA, the highest priority was to persuade their compatriots, serving in the ranks of the King Emperor, to abandon their posts and, quite literally, to cross sides. How else could the Azad Hind Faj, so small in numbers and so lightly armed, hope to reach Delhi? After some time, South Lancashire, from here, they started. Our machine guns had only Two, two belts each, 
and uh, it was only within few minutes our uh, belts were finished and our uh, machine guns became silent. But before they became silent, they had killed quite a number of South Lancashire people. Even their commander had to swim across in his pajamas and in his, uh, you see, underwear. And they also went back. I thought that after the Indian uh, brigade using the British is uh, a political action so that uh, the Indians are not, you see, mentally, um, they, 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 they don't go pro INA. So I was very happy. As the golden glow of dawn stole over the waters of the Irrawaddy, it seemed that the Lancastrians' attack had receded. However, a little later, as bright sunshine flooded the plain, the British launched a second assault. Artillery and air bombardment of this area started. Our men were charging the uh, machine gun belts. And they thought that they have silenced our guns. So when they advanced, and this time our men had better experience, they did not start shooting from distance. When they had come only about 200 yards there, our machine guns opened. And poor fellows, they lost about 400 killed in that battle. So as Slim has also put it, both at Bagan and at Nyangu, their attack became standstill. But the fundamental British superiority in resources and numbers began to tell. Assisted by covering artillery support, they launched waves of attacks across the river. All our ammunition we had exhausted. Again, when they attacked, we could not withhold them. And I'm sorry to say, that here, my that gallant battalion commander, Lieutenant Hari Ram, he had to surrender. But he surrendered only with a party. And even that poor fellow was killed by some of the INA men who did not wish to surrender. About 112 people of our surrender. Our casualties in all this battle was between three to four hundred total. All the many years that have passed since that fateful day have not erased from Colonel Dillon's mind the blood of the four hundred men who paid the price of freedom here on the banks of the Irrawaddy. This place to me is very sacred. I wish those men were with me. The saga of the INA, however, was far from over. To the southeast, Mount Popa beckoned. And late on the night of the 14th, Colonel Dillon ordered his men to fall back as far as Mount Popa. The last stand of the INA was yet to come. Standing 5,000 feet above sea level, Mount Popa rises dramatically out of what geographers call the dry belt. According to legend, there was an enormous tremor in the 5th century BC, and Mount Popa, the sacred mountain of Burma, emerged out of the central plain. By the third week of February 1945, the British 14th Army had crossed the Irrawaddy. General Slim was well aware of the impact the monsoons would have on the advance of his army. So he wanted to provoke the decisive battle for Burma well short of Rangoon. His target lay 70 miles south of Mandalay, the Japanese administrative center, Maiktila. 
General Slim compared Mike Taylor to the wrist of a hand, whose extended fingers were the Japanese lines of supply and communication. Crush that wrist, he said, and no blood will flow through the fingers. The whole hand will be paralyzed. The Japanese resistance would collapse and he would be in Rangoon before the rains. But the only direct metal road from Baga to Maiktila passed through Chauk Padang. And 50 miles before Maiktila, it passed through the looming shadow of Mount Popa. It was to deny General William Slim the use of this vital road that Shanawaz Khan, Prem Kumar Segal, and Gurbaksh Singh Dhillam came to Mount Popa towards the end of February 1945. After all, they had to fulfill Netaji's call to pay freedom's price by preventing the advance of the British, if only for a short while. This is Mount Popa, our last stand against the British forces was here where some of the bloodiest battles were fought to defend this strategic mountain. It was here that our headquarters were located. It was here that Shanwaz, Segal and I came together and it was because of our actions at this place that we were tried together in the Red Fort of Delhi for waging war against His Majesty the King Emperor. The battle had been lost at the Irrawaddy, but not the spirit of the INA, and Colonel Dillon and his men were ready for what would be the final chapter in the Burmese war. The most memorable day for me was the 17th of February, 1945, when I withdrew from Bagan and had arrived here. On the 18th, Colonel Sagal came up with his second infantry regiment and he gave me the command of Chok Badang area and himself held Popa. Colonel Seigel had come up from Rangoon to take command. He arrived on the morning of the 18th. The INA's last stand at Popa was to have a lasting effect on him. Lakshmi Seigel, who married him after the war, remembers the stories he used to tell. On the top of a hill, Colonel Prem Kumar Sagal found a little Buddha. He placed the statue in a cave, and he decided to make that his headquarters. He believed that it was this Buddha who protected him during those difficult days. Colonel Dillon attempts to retrace the path to this cave. He last walked on these jungle tracks 50 years ago. His steps may have slowed, but his determination remains unchanged. This is the place. This is the place where our headquarters was. This is the place where Buddha protected us. No commander could ask for a better air raid shelter or a trench than this. Oh, how wonderful, how wonderful. It is still the same after half a century. 
The INA soldiers operating from this cave would ensure that a lighted candle was always placed under the Buddha. This cave sheltered our headquarters during the bloodiest days of February, March, and April 1945. It was here that we had our first aid center. Our serious patients could be treated here. And after battles, we could write orders during the night without fear of the air raids or the artillery bombardment. Enemy was supreme in the air. And they had, had artillery. We didn't have any gun. We didn't have even uh, machine guns at that time. And this was uh, a boon to us. Today, when I come to this place after half a century, I cannot help bowing to Lord Buddha, thanking to the people of Popa how they helped us. I bow to this place. As she places a candle here to the memory of her husband, the past catches up with Lakshmi Saigal. Suddenly, the stories her husband had told for decades begin to unfold here with fresh life. Until the very end, he had cherished his memories of the last stand at Popa. I was never here, but of all his war experiences, I felt that the battle of both Popa and surrounding areas, and the time he spent in Popa, in his headquarter, were the most memorable and significant time of Colonel Seigel's life. He was never tired of telling us about the Battle of Popa and of all the dangers they suffered and about the magnificent sacrifices made by some of his officers and men. He used to tell, about, tell us about it so much that when I was expecting my first child, I laughingly told him, I'm sure if it's a boy, you would like to call him Popa. So he said, that would be a wonderful idea. But fortunately, we had a daughter whom we called Subhashini. Colonel Dillon's responsibility was to carry out extensive and persistent guerrilla raids in the areas between Popa and Chaukpadang in the east, and as far forward towards the Irrawaddy as possible. The INA's objective was to squeeze Slim's supply lines by denying him the use of the Niau Mike Tiller metal road as a supply line for reinforcements to his troops fighting the Battle of Mike Tiller. This was the site of one of the bloodiest battles in Popa region. This is the road which connected Nangu and Bagan with Mactila and Mount Popa. I had orders to deny the British this road, use of this road, so that they could not take Mount Popa for attacking Mactila. I was successful in withholding it up to 13th of April, 1945. During one of these operations at Tauza village on that road, there occurred the incident that is described in the INA's history as the charge of the immortals. Even a British military intelligence report was forced to concede the men of the INA were fighting British equipment, aircraft, guns and tanks, with rifles, bullet carts, and empty stomachs. The story of Mount Popa and Chokmadang area will be incomplete without telling the story of this little dry pond, which was broader, and the bushes and crops weren't there at that time when Gyan Singh Bhisht 
a company commander with only 98 men had ordered to check the enemy advancing on this road coming from Bagan on to Chokbadam. One day, the 16th of March, 1945, 13 tanks, 11 armored cars, and 10 loaded uh, trucks of men advanced. He had orders to stop the enemy at all cost, which he did to the best of his ability. When they, they had no ammunition left, then Gyan Singh Bhishti's men, they got onto the tanks. The tanks people and the others have to debus and hand-to-hand -hand fight ensued. In that, we had lost 40 lives and an equal number of the enemy. This was one of the fiercest fights of the battle. When Gyan Singh Bhisht was replanning his men and giving out orders, a bomb hit him in the head and he fell down, never to give out orders again. He was one of my bravest men and I miss him even today after 50 years. The guerrilla operations depended to a great extent on support from the Burmese people, not only for intelligence and shelter, but for food and water. He may be able to tell us. Colonel Dillon comes upon one such village, Gwen Beu, and tries to find someone who might remember him. A soldier can't ever forget those who helped him survive during his days on the battlefield. These villages, this is Guabenu. This village helped us a lot. My ration distributing distribution during the night was done on the road here. And the headman was very, very kind to me. You see? The, all these people were Minglava. Minglava. Ha, 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 ha. Uh, ask her whose uh, that house is. Is the owner there? Can, can go. We can go and see him. He is around about 50 or 60 years old. Oh, let us go to him. Huh. I may be able to talk to him. Which way? Which is the way? Ma, Amma, Minglava, Sebuji, but if I got in Java, I said it by me, Amri. Eh? During war, were you here? Headman, Headman. I, I used to come. You give me rice. Tell them that Indian soldiers, they used to give us sheep, yeah. uh, chicken, chicken that's right, yeah. tomato, yeah, tomato, and uh, yeah. alu. Yeah. You used to give us. Jesu Timade. Jesu Timade. Yeah. What does she say? She remembers. Yeah. 
In his final speech on the eve of his departure from Burma on April the 24th, 1945, Netaji had concluded by saying, the day will come when free India will repay the debt of gratitude to the people of Burma for all the help that I have received in carrying on this struggle. Finally, Colonel Dillon is able to express his gratitude, though half a century later. The Japanese resistance at Maitila ended at dusk on March the 3rd, 1945. Slim had his wrist. The general could now barely wait to clear the Irrawaddy Valley of all opposition in order to hasten his arrival in Rangoon before the monsoon. He mounted a three-pronged attack on the INA at Popa. In the north from Tangta, in the west from Nyangu, and in the east from Maiktila. On March the 30th, Colonel Premsegel took up positions seven miles north of Popa. It was here, in Leji, that the bloodiest battle was to be waged. I know how important the battle of Leji was to, in the INA campaign. Colonel Seigel used to talk about it very frequently and so much so that our first house in Kanpur after we got married was called Leggy. So of course when anybody asked why we had named it then he would explain all about the battle of Leggy. Because although it did not end in a victory for the INA, it was here that his officers and men performed exemplary acts of courage and bravery, many of which ended in their laying down their lives during the battle. And this was a source of great inspiration for him. And he felt that the honor of the INA, which had been besmirched by a few desertions, was fully vindicated by the bravery of these officers and men at the Battle of Leji. British, and for that matter, Indian military historians, pay little attention to the confrontation at Leji. In the ranks of the INA, though, not only is the Battle of Leji a matter of pride, it is looked upon as an unqualified success. One lightly armed battalion with no artillery and no air support faced and resisted an entire brigade. When Prem Saigal finally withdrew from his positions on April the 4th, it was not defeat that prompted his retreat, rather the fact that his battalion had almost ceased to exist. On April the 25th, 1945, Colonel Prem Kumar Saigal was captured by the British. Shah Nawaz and Dillon were to follow him on May the 17th. Their war was over though none in their hearts nor in their minds would acknowledge it. Three months later, Shah Nawaz, Segal, and Dillon were placed on trial before a court-martial in Delhi's Red Fort for waging war against the British sovereign. The British censors had managed successfully until then to black out all news about the existence of the Freedom Army. When the truth dawned on the Indian people, there was an outcry throughout the country. General Orkinlay, the British commander-in-chief, found himself on the horns of a dilemma. He couldn't possibly court-martial an entire army. Equally, as commander-in-chief, he couldn't overlook the actions of soldiers who had preferred to abandon the British Union Jack for the Indian flag. The British could no longer take the loyalty of their Indian troops for granted. And yet, without the British Indian Army, the Raj would not have survived. As their trial began, Shah Nawaz Khan, Prem Kumar Sagal, and Gurbak Singh Dillon must have worn secret smiles. In their own way, they had in fact completed the march on Delhi. Indians who will be born not as slaves, but as free men, 
because of your colossal sacrifice, will proudly proclaim to the world that you, their forebears, fought and lost the battle, but through temporary failure paved the way to ultimate success and glory. The darkest hour always precedes the dawn. India shall be free, and before long. Singapore, the Queen of the East, known in legend as Temasek, was the stage from which the dramatic and inspiring story of the Indian National Army was first enacted. It was Singapore from where the Azad Hind expedition began its 10,000 kilometer journey to Delhi, retracing the footsteps of the Indian National Army. With Christmas only a week away, Singapore wore a bright, festive look. Accompanied by the three INA veterans, the legendary Colonel Dillon, Colonel Lakshmi Seidel, and Captain Yadav, we set out to discover places associated with the INA. Farrah Park, where the Indian prisoners of war were handed over to General Mohan Singh by the Japanese. The grassy grounds of the Padal, where the INA troops first demonstrated their resolve to fight to the finish. Cathay Hall, which in July 1943 had echoed with the shouting of nationalist slogans as Netaji promised the Indians in East Asia that the sun would finally set on the British Empire. And the INA monument on the seafront, rebuilt on the ruins of the original one, destroyed by Mountbatten when the British reconquered Singapore in 1945. The monument is now a rallying point and a place of pilgrimage for the living veterans of the INA. Paying our homage to the glorious sons and daughters of India who laid down their lives for the freedom of their motherland, the expedition left Singapore. Crossing the Johor Strait to the Malay Peninsula, our searching gaze was riveted by the luxuriant tropical vegetation, groves of tall palm trees, and the splendid highways that carry you like a breeze. Kuala Lumpur has all the enlivening signs of a flourishing 20th century boom town. Broad, clean avenues full of cars, a baffling web of concrete flyovers, Crowds of people hurrying to their workplaces, shopping mouths overflowing with electronic goods, buzzing fast food stalls, and high-rise buildings that dazzle the eye. With Indian settlers accounting for 10% of Malaysia's population, the country was a fertile ground for INA recruitment and fund collection. We spent a sentimental evening with some of the INA veterans living in Malaysia the heroic Captain Amrik Singh Gill of the INA Secret Service, who infiltrated India and was captured during an operation. He escaped while being taken for execution. He now sits crippled and confined to a wheelchair. Leaving Kuala Lumpur, we were caught in a heavy downpour of winter rains. When the rain stopped, we could see for miles plantations of tall, spindly rubber trees The highway running through the center of the Malay Peninsula was fast and smooth. No potholes, no encroachments, no speed breakers, no cyclists or herds of cattle. Stars were already in the sky when we arrived at Guantan, greeted by the pandemic beating of Malay drums.
From the estuary town of Kwantan, we took the coastal route with the South China Sea always in view. Our energies drained from all the shoving and pushing, we stopped by a roadside restaurant to sample the debatable delights of a Malay delicacy. Let me feed you. Come on. Very nice. I like it. Take it more. Take more. Take more. Take more. Take more. Take more. Take While others beat a hasty retreat, Sunil Dutt stood his ground and suffered till the end. As we left Kuala Tarangano for Penang on a 650 kilometer drive that would take us across the peninsula Malaysia, the monsoons were upon us in earnest. Approaching the central mountains, we could hear the noise of rain in the distance. It grew louder and louder until, with a thundering roar, squalls of rain began lashing the jeeps. The scenery was awesome, wild and rough. The dense forest trees soaring 200 feet into the sky and huge creepers hanging on them in graceful festoons. We wondered if the wild Semang, the Negrito dwarfs who had lived in these jungles for 8,000 years still existed. Crossing a 14 kilometer long bridge, the longest in Asia, we arrived on the island of Penang, the glittering gem of the ocean, the headquarters of the INA Secret Service, and the launching pad for INA soldiers taking the sea route to the battlefronts of Burma. For those who enjoy seafood, Penang is the place. Restaurants display live fish in an aquarium before cooking your selection. While we waited for the Burmese ship to fetch us from Penang, we amused ourselves on the beach, riding water scooters, parasailing, and swimming nervously, looking out for sea snakes that lived in these waters. When MV Hakka sailed in, it could not find a berth in the busy port. We loaded our vehicles on a barge, and using steel ropes and sandbags, lifted them onto the ship anchored in open seas. With only the expeditionists and the five vehicles on board, we had the entire ship to ourselves. It was three days and three nights of perfect, restful happiness. No phone calls to wake you up, no newspapers to depress your spirits, no bills to pay, Breakfast at noon, napping under the awnings, engulfed in a motionless sea, its waters as smooth as glass, with nothing in sight except the far horizon. We arrived at the mouth of the Gulf of Martaban and escorted by a squadron of seagulls, 
sailed into a broad, deep puddle, stirring up huge quantities of mud. A large part of Mulmeen's population of 200,000 is of Indian origin. The Indians migrated here during the 19th century, when Burma became a part of British India. Hundreds of these settlers now turned up to welcome the expedition, defying the country's martial law that prohibits gatherings of more than nine people. The Azad Hind expedition was a confident statement of India's foreign policy of friendship and peaceful coexistence with its neighbors. In this spirit of mutual respect and love, we visited the old people's home in Mulmeen and presented its residents with small bronze Buddhas. The road from Mulmeen to Rangoon belongs in a museum. It appears to be a remnant of World War II. However, it is full of interesting spectacles. To our right was the Golden Rock Pagoda, a giant boulder in the sky, balancing on another rock, said to be supported by a strand of Buddha's hair, attracting believers and unbelievers alike. Escorted by Burmese military and intelligence officers, our convoy was rushed through the streets of Rangoon at night. Whisked into our hotel, the gates were slammed shut. We were told not to leave the hotel with our vehicles. The government had withdrawn permission for the expedition to travel further through Burma. Trying to trace people and places associated with the INA, we spent our days in Rangoon, always under the eye of Big Brother. Behind a gloomy Rangoon ghetto, in a lonely grave, forgotten and unknown, lies Bahadur Shah Zafar, the last Mughal emperor of India, who took up arms against the British and for that heroic deed was exiled to Rangoon in 1857. आज मुझे उस वक्त की याद आ रही है जब के नेताजी सुभाष चंद्र बोस मजार की मिट्टी को उठा के उसी की कसम खाई थी कि अब हिंदुस्तान के आखिरी शहंशाह मैं तेरी मिट्टी की कसम खा के कहता हूँ और बहादुर शाह जफर का ही शेर पड़ा था राजियों में भी रहेगी जब तक ईमान की तब से लंदन तक चलेगी तेज हिंदुस्तान की और वो तेज लेके ये सारी आगे बढ़ते On New Year's Eve, all our worries were forgotten, and the sounds of merrymaking resounded as we danced into 1996. Rangoon is a city full of mystic marvels. The Shwedagon Pagoda, the most impressive shrine of Buddhism. The giant reclining Buddha, unmoved and unattached, observing developments in this once mighty empire. Our patience tested, the military authorities relaxed the ban on our movements and allowed us to travel further north on the condition that we did not attract attention.
two days later, when we arrived at Ziawadi, there was an avalanche of Indians from the surrounding villages, a great surge of common people, old and young, men, women, and children, whose families had given money and their lives for India's independence. So many of them came to greet the expedition. As we left Ziawadi, we were intercepted by the intelligence and told to return to Rangoon without delay. If we did not, the leaders of the Indian community would be at risk. Back in Rangoon, the Burmese authorities made it clear that only one point was open to discussion, and that was the early departure of the expedition. There was no choice but to retreat. But we did manage to extract one concession the veterans and the film crew would be allowed to complete the route within Burma. <laughs> Colonel Dillon and Captain Lakshmi Seidel were visibly excited. They never forgot Burma. That was the place where their youthful dreams were put into action. That was the scene of many struggles and the source many memories for them, whether of joy or of sorrow. Fifty years ago, they were young, full of nationalist pride and passion and hope, and the world lay waiting for them. Now, 50 years later, in the sunset of their lives, with youth and illusions gone, they moved once again to the center of the stage. An Indian Air Force transport plane airlifted the rest of the members and the vehicles from Rangoon to Imphal to continue the expedition. Once back in India, we set out for the places where the INA had seen action in Manipur. We drove through the Palail airstrip that was captured by Major Pritam Singh after fierce fighting and crossing the Lotu River. We drove to the frontier town of Mure on the Burmese border. It was tempting to cross the border and drive into Burma once again. The administrator of Tamu on the Burmese side invited us to enter his territory, which we did. <laughs> we drove back on the same iron-girded bridge that had once been used by the Azad Brigade to cross into Moray on its way to take part in the fighting in Minta and Nauru. We traveled the length of the Tidim Imphal Road in South Manipur, from which the number one division of the INA had knocked on the gates of Imphal. Our convoy arrived in a procession at Moiran, where on April the 18th, 1944, Sardare Jung Shaukat Ali Malik hoisted the Indian flag in an atmosphere of excited and belligerent expectation. Our rugged vehicles climbed boldly up a virtually non-existent trail to the summit of Red Hill, the last strategic spot captured by the INA. Ten kilometers to the north was Imphal, the capture of which could have been the turning point in World War II. It was from Red Hill 
that the INA's retreat began. As we negotiated the winding mountain road to Kohima, our eyes were never weary of the lush green hillscape. Tall flames swayed in the fire as angelic looking Naga girls gave us a warm and affectionate welcome. Under the mellow moonlight of a January winter, the Naga land of poetry and romance stood revealed. All along the route, entire villages would be waiting to greet the expedition. As we got into the more populated areas of Assam, our vehicles were crawling through a virtual sea of humanity. The drive from Shillong to Cherapunji is like traveling to the ends of the earth. The rugged mountains, the deep gorges and canyons, the play of light, all combine to give an impression of having arrived at the very edges of the planet. Descending into the valley of the Brahmaputra and racing past the forests of North Bengal, we headed along the gorge of the Tista to Gantok. Beyond the charms of Gantok lay the most wondrous winter panorama of giant mountains clad in fresh snow, frozen lakes, yaks exhaling clouds of refrigerated breath. Our vehicles climbed to dizzying heights on the wet and icy road, negotiating an endless series of hairpin bends with ease and confidence. Under the most adverse road and weather conditions, we drove on the treacherous road to Nathula, beyond which lay Tibet. Engulfed by dense fog and clouds, we raised full-throated slogans of Jai Hind. <laughs> Within India, the expedition became a mass contact program to create an awakening amongst the youth of their national responsibilities. As the expedition progressed through Bengal and on the Grand Trunk Road across Bihar and Uttar Pradesh, the huge crowds provided us with a captive audience to whom we could communicate our message. Recalling the glorious sacrifices of the INA soldiers, we appealed to the youth to rededicate themselves to the high principles of our freedom fighters, to raise the country to new levels of achievement and national growth, and take up the challenge of fighting poverty. Having captured the spirit of the freedom struggle, the Azad Hind expedition arrived at the gates of the Red Fort in Delhi, once the goal of the Indian national. 